John Maselli was a member of the 8th Air Force in World War II, considered by many to be the greatest air armada of all time. Of the roughly 350,000 who served, 26,000 were killed in action and 28,000 were taken as prisoners of war. Those who survived were offered a unique chance to look back at what will hopefully be the last world war. How many was on the crew again? How many? Well, there were pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, and then uh, four and six gunners. Mm. So we had uh, nose, upper gunner, ball gunner, tail gunner, and like two waist gunners. So, uh, and they were auxiliaries. Like, see, the engineer, he might have been a waist gunner too, because mm. he weren't. He'd take care of the plane, but sure. then if, if if he wasn't doing that and they were attacked, he'd grab a gun on the sides and then that you know, would uh, help. The United States Air Force played a critical part in helping to win the war. John describes the role he and his fellow airmen played in turning the tide against Germany. We would bomb marshalling yards, uh, railroad cars or stuff. You know, we were disrupting their... The Germans were so quick, you know, you could bomb something here and by the next day or so they had this all ready to go again because they could bring in repair crews because the railroads were well. well. So then we started bombing the railroads. And if we could disrupt a whole railroad area, uh, then that was going to slow their, their fixing things up after we were bombing too. The purpose of the bombing raids was simple, cripple the enemy's ability to create and maintain their machines of war. They ran out of gas, you know, <laughs> and he just couldn't send them up like he used to. He would send up a whole formation like we see in that movie, uh, they'd be coming at you. And, and then, uh, in the early days, if you were wounded, if you had one engine knocked out, then you were had to make the whole trip home. So that's when they would send them after you. If they found a, a crippled plane, boom, they just kept hitting away at them. John officially flew 13 missions, but there was supposed to be a 14th. And the mission that never was, was also perhaps John's closest brush with death. When we had the gas leak it was scary as hell. Yeah. I had my chute hooked up already on me and the camera hatch was open. And I was ready to jump, but all I had to do was get word from the pilot. And, and then and they said, when we did, you know, we didn't jump, but we were there and we dropped our bombs. And then I heard that if you hit that North Sea water about 30 seconds or two minutes or something, you know, well, we did have some clothes on, maybe that would have saved us. And they did have, they had boats that would come from the English coast, but it might have taken an hour. Jumping out of your plane over the North Sea meant an almost certain death from hypothermia. So what had the crew a heartbeat away from abandoning ship? We were taking off on a mission, and you take off in 30 second intervals, but you're all lined up already, your motors are running, they're all warmed up, and uh, then you this one would go, and then this would go. <coughs> And so it was our turn, we got on a runway, we're taking off, and all of a sudden, whoa, gas is coming in both sides, gas is coming out of the wing tanks, and, and the caps, the, the things are screwed down and sealed with wire. Hmm. So there was no reason for that happening. So then, uh, of course, uh, we, we took off and Pete LaBarbera juggled our gas in the tanks until he got it to stop. And then we, we circled around a little bit and they contact the headquarters or the, the uh, field and they asked what we should do because we don't think we could make the mission. Uh, we might have lost 50 gallons of gas. And they said, well, just a minute, and then they called back and they said, 
go out over the North Sea, drop your, your bombs, and then come back. So that's what we did. Mechanical failure is nothing new. Neither is military procedure. The pilot, the co-pilot, and the, uh, oh, of course the engineer, they have to go in for an inquiry. And it doesn't have to be that day. It might be a week from now, you know, depending on what, what they have set up. But, uh, see, we never heard the uh, crew people, I never heard what happened to it, but I knew we had to have an inquiry because we dropped their bombs and it's a report. So for every abortion there has to be an inquiry and they have to settle it one way or another. If they blame the crew, I don't know what damage they could do or what fine they would pay or something. See now there were crews who would fake it and they would fly on to Sweden if they were halfway there say and then they'd be interned for the rest of the war. And that worked out for them, but, <coughs> but if too many guys did that, then their heads, heads had to roll. Once cleared, the crew was back to the business of winning the war, and one of the most commonly used weapons in that fight was the firebomb. The way ours worked was there were two 500-pound bombs, and after it fell a certain way, the bomb would open up into two pound sticks and and those sticks if there was a sheet of steel that would burn through it it was uh, a uh, what would you call it it was phosphorus phosphorus like phosphorus or, or something yeah that would it could burn in water so it wasn't you know when it yeah. would open up and so uh, we dropped that on some towns too, but the Germans did that too, I think, mm -hmm. before us. And uh, it, you couldn't put it out. You, if you could bury it in sand, maybe it would work all right, but you couldn't quite put out the, the fire or the flame. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, like the one show, we bombed Willemshaven, mm -hmm. and we bombed that with fire bombs, I think, and mm -hmm. it really burned away. Uh, yeah, maybe most of the town there. Yeah. While public opinion played an important role in the outcome of Vietnam, during the Second World War, faced with what Hitler was capable of, there was very little opposition to the fire bombings from back home. But what was it like for the men dropping the bombs? Was it troubling bombing uh, like civilian towns, or was that not the the point? Uh, I guess if there was a target within a town that got bombed, right? Or Probably, but I don't even remember them caring anymore because he had tried bombing, uh, a fire bombing London many times, so he did burn big sections of London. <clears throat> but, uh, and so, they, they swore that... Uh, a bomb would never fall on Berlin. Well, that didn't work out for us either. Yeah. War is ugly. When the world is at stake, sometimes fire is the only way to fight fire. I don't remember that anybody would even mention it there, but, but we did do some fire bombing in some cities, I know. Mm -hmm. and, and I read where some of it was so bad that it burnt the air in the city whereas people were dying and they weren't even touched by the fire. So that, that's pretty serious too. But there was reasons for bombing those cities. In the end, the bombing raids were successful in grinding Hitler's war machine to a stop. Combined with the incredible sacrifices and successes of the army, navy, and allied forces, the war in Europe was won. But the war with Japan raged on, and that is where John was to be sent. The rumor was that we had to go to 29th school and right. then Japan. Well, I just loved to travel, so I didn't let that okay. thing. I thought it would be a great trip. But John never got to Japan. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, followed by a second on the city of Nagasaki on August 9th. 
The result was the combined death of well over 100,000 Japanese citizens and the unconditional surrender of Japan, bringing an official end to the Second World War. Once they dropped the bomb, I was still in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, waiting to go to 29th school. And boy, we had, that was such a party in that, from what we heard, the tavern ran out of beer at 7 o'clock. So people were out in the streets, all over the streets, and, and, and they were jammed. I mean, you couldn't get a car driving down the street. There were just people. And then they're handing you a bottle. You know, this could have been rum, this could have been whiskey. And that's when I got so sick. Celebrating in the wake of so many dead Japanese citizens may be hard to imagine today. But with 60 million already dead from the war and an untold number of dead that loomed on the horizon if the war continued, the end, by any means, was welcomed. Yeah, when it was dropped, everybody was happy about that because they gave up then. So, yeah. And that was, I think, the right thing to do. I know it killed a lot of people, but if you, the way they estimated us making a landing in Japan, yeah. we would have lost 100,000 people. Easily. Easily. Yeah. With 87 years of wisdom and his own first-hand experiences, what's John's view on war? People are getting a little weary of it, I hope. John was a student of history and felt most modern wars were not worth the men and women's lives that were lost. His general philosophy, avoid war at all cost unless it is absolutely necessary. For John, there was no question about the necessity of World War II. World War II was, uh, at least there were reasons, you know, because of what we'd heard of the different killings and, and, uh, and Hitler's uh, ideas of conquering the world and, and, you know, making it his world. So that was way out of line. But there, I'd say, the, there was no problem with getting people to sign up because, and then when Japan bombed us, well, that even more so, the lines were blocked long trying to get in. So, uh, but since then, I think we've gotten a little bit of intelligence, but it'll go away and they'll come back and they'll be doing it again. What do you think can help us avoid war in the future? I think what would be helpful are the museums where they can go and see the planes that were being used and see the tanks and the guns and, the, and movies could bring a lot of it back to where it gives them some feeling of what was really going on, because it wasn't... Uh, of course, there's books, too, yeah. uh, <coughs> that are quite... Are, uh, some books, like I have a few from uh, uh, an author that I like, who had a, quite an ability to bring you right, right. up into the fighting. Yeah. And uh, it really made it real. Learning is, as always, the key. But as it was when John was in school, today's youth can't simply sit back and expect to be taught everything they need to know. What you'd say is then it's important for them to be educated on history, to be... Oh yes, I, I feel that we are really doing a disservice right now. People don't know history, hardly any of it. Yeah, and that to me is, is hurting. Um, of course, to me, it was one of my favorite subjects, so that right. was different. I loved it, yeah. uh, any kind of history. <coughs> but um, today, uh, you, uh, Jay Leno gets on TV sometime when he asks questions, oh, you know, to that. college okay. students. They don't know where Iowa was, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's disgraceful. but. But they don't have the interest and they don't get it in school, so I guess that's the way it goes. And I don't know, maybe when we were in school, in grade school, say even, I don't know that we had a lot of Civil War history. Hmm. We, we did tell about it, and uh, we had Abraham Lincoln, and, but maybe we weren't doing that well either. Uh, but since... <laughs> it was it was always my my subject that I liked uh, yeah. history, and uh, so I did a lot of reading on my own in in many of those cases. 
John never lost his love of history and knew the importance of preserving it and passing it on to future generations. You're part of the historical society of the of the Air Force branch. Air Force, yeah. yeah. And you've been telling me that I mean, you're watching your generation kind of of dwindle, Can disintegrate. You, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like a few months ago, there was a lot of people, and now we had we would have meetings with 150 people. We yeah. rent a big, pretty good size hall, and we would have the dinners, and uh, sometimes they have. Um, a choral group come out and sing, or some some guy once was uh, from ROTC and he was teaching us how these new uh, planes without people flying them would work, and we were it was kind of educational too. And other guys would get up and tell about their their close call and <coughs> bombing or something. But it's down, like you said. Last time it was less than 25, so that's getting scary. And like Mary says, maybe we just got to join some other groups so we have a little more people in the group. Yeah. And uh, it may not be Air Force, it might be Army enlisted us, uh, World War II vets, and that might be enough. But it's, it's going, yes. Books, movies, and museums are all terrific tools, but nothing can bring it home like a first-hand account. I feel like having people like yourself to be able to talk to really helps bring home the reality of what really happened. I mean, oh, you yes. can watch it, but but as as your generation dwindles, <laughs> that's going to become harder. harder and harder. harder to get. And that's I feel true. it's it's going to be more difficult for kids to fully grasp what really right. happened. Right except for books and movies, but then I don't know if you really get the, the real feel of it unless you're talking to someone who was in it and there were guys in it, you know. So, but there are not many left, true, you know. So, we'll just go on and something else will come up. <laughs> and that'll be our problem. <laughs> that'll be, yeah. Eternal thanks to John Maselli and all of the men and women who have fought, have fallen, and who still serve today. Well, great. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I really appreciate it. All okay. right. <coughs> Read history. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the thing.